Notice, notice here, Clube, Clube, Victus, Victor Klub and, and Bill Napier in The Cosmic Winter. That was the book I told you about a month ago that you couldn't get now for less than 100 bucks. Long out of print. 1990, this is what they wrote. After discussing the sudden collapse of ancient civilizations and focusing in on um, the, uh, the collapse of civilization in the Middle East, they commented this in their book. They said, Complementing such an observational program, a fresh, fresh exploration of the past, armed now with the new astronomical understandings, is also necessary, not just for its own sake, but also to arrive at a better understanding of the risks. For example, one would like to find physical evidence to confirm or deny an astronomical catastrophe in the Near East in the second millennium BC. Now, in 1990, Klub and Napier were still considered on the fringe. Now right. these were the guys who were predicting in 1980 that the real threat to Earth was fragmenting comets that created a whole big array of debris, a swarm. Well, with Shoemaker-Levy 9 in 94, they were pretty much vindicated on that account. Now this is in 1990, they're still considered crackpots, right? Saying, we would like to find astronomical evidence associated with the collapse of civilizations in the Middle East in the second millennium BC. Well then look what happened in 2001. <laughs> Scientists have found the first evidence that a devastating meteor impact in the Middle East might have triggered the mysterious collapse of civilizations more than 4,000 years ago. Studies of satellite images of southern Iraq have revealed a two mile wide circular depression which scientists bear, say bears all the hallmarks of an impact crater. If confirmed, it would point to the Middle East being struck by a meteor with the violence equivalent to hundreds of nuclear bombs. Now, if this did in fact happen, and I'm going to guess I would put my money on it, because so far I've been betting all along for 20 years that the catastrophists are right, and I haven't lost yet. If this turns out to be correct, well, this is really a major impetus of history that has been completely overlooked. You will not open any history book on the history of civilization and find any reference to early civilization suddenly being aborted by a meteorite impact. And yet it appears that that is actually the case. And it appears once again to vindicate the, the, neo, the British neo-catastrophists. Um, Who went to war with them back then? What? So he went to war with Iraq back then. Well, interestingly, <laughs> the scientists wanted to get over and study this, but that the whole plan sort of got put on the shelf. Separate <coughs> group of scientists studying here. Scientists say comets smashed into southern Germany in 200 BC. <laughs> Unleashing energy equivalent to thousands of atomic bombs. Uh, here we're seeing finally right around the turn of the millennium some progressive astronomers are asking the question did asteroids and comets turn the tides of civilization? And now the answer seems to be almost certainly, yes, they did, Virginia, they did. Now here, our, our discussion that we opened with, he's talking about the 6th century A.D. Notice he mentions famine raged during the Dark Ages, uh, pestilence spread, death came early and hard, dynasties died. Such a time came in the 6th century A.D. The Dark Ages. We all learned about the Dark Ages in school, right? Well, Rome had been beaten back from its empire. Art and science stagnated. Even the sun turned its back. And now he, and there's dozens of quotes like this from this period. We marvel to see no shadows of our bodies at noon, to feel the mighty vigor of the sun's heat wasted into feebleness. Italian historian Flavius Cassiodorus wrote at the time, we have summer without heat. The crops have been chilled by north wind, and the rain is denied. In now, China... If, if an object come in, where did it hit at in the 13th century, though? We'll get to that. The stars were lost from view for three months. The sun dimmed, the rain failed, and the snow fell in the summertime. Famine spread, and the emperor abandoned his capital amid political and economic disasters. Then came pestilence. The Justinian plague, named for a Byzantine empire, apparently began in Central Asia, spread into Egypt, and then swept across Europe. 
Hundreds of thousands died. The world had gone to hell in a hurry, if the historical accounts can be believed. But with neither evidence of global disaster nor a viable cause, the records were widely doubted by historians. But new evidence, however, supports the tales of ancient scribes and identifies brief but brutal times of worldwide ecological catastrophe. The evidence is in tree rings, which clearly show several years of cold weather. Now, actually, when you get into it, it appears that some of those uh, tree rings show that over, like, over most of Europe, there was several years with no summer. Food systems collapsed. People got weak, and here comes the plague. Now, what we in, in, when we opened the discussion tonight, we were talking about the possibility of the very same factor, the cosmic dust that produces this darkening of the sun and the, the cold, also introducing microbes that could lead to the plague. Here's what I've got underlined. Let's emphasize with that. What weapon does nature wield that is powerful enough to alter the course of civilizations within a few years? The most likely explanation. The best fit with the evidence is that described by both Chinese and Europeans as dragons in the sky. Pieces of comets, or perhaps of asteroids, crashed into Earth, spewing a veil of dust that encircled the world and dimmed the sun. Now what we find over and over again is the evidence that the dragon was the preeminent symbol utilized to represent the close encounters. Question: If if we if we have Star Wars and we can now protect ourselves from these things, then we're not going to get new sprouting of new life forms, and maybe that's what jumps us from one level to another. Well, see, there's other factors now, and that's again that's us. You know, if you want to look at this in the cosmic perspective, the way I see it is that. Over the lifespan of a galaxy, you may have, and this is something that we should have a, have a lecture on, about the new evidence emerging about the likelihood of habitable planets. And it turns out that the conditions required for a habitable planet are very, very, very narrow indeed. And even now, as we're beginning to discover planetary objects around other solar systems, we're also seeing that those planetary objects don't look anywhere remotely like they would be suitable for the emergence of higher life. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like we're seeing, discovering planets, for example, that are the size of Jupiter. Well, higher life is not going to form on a planet the size of Jupiter. The gravity would crush anything that tried to go beyond the microbial state. You know, there's a very narrow range. And the way I read the, the Akashic records, if you want, is that in, there's plenty of incipient biotic planets forming. But what happens is they get to a threshold that requires a quantum leap. And that quantum leap is that the bio biological life, the biosphere, has to move from being purely terrestrial based to becoming celestial, to becoming cosmic. And there, there has to be a way, nature has to have some type of a strategy for accomplishing that. And I believe, in the, as far as here on planet Earth, we humans are the strategy by which nature will accomplish that. Nature is trying to diversify its life to create it, to put it into a much more invulnerable position with respect to these cosmic catastrophes. And we are the agency by which nature will affect that strategy. We're the only agency by which that could happen. And clearly, what is the point of even being concerned about human-induced pollution and human-induced de defilement of the environment if it turns out that what we're doing is a mosquito bite compared to this stuff. And it is. Right. It is. Th the kind of devastation and pollution and, uh, and complete destruction of the environment that would take place in one of these events so far goes so far beyond anything that we humans, paltry humans, have yet done that there's really almost no way to compare the events. But let's say that Star Wars does get to a place where it can it can shoot these things down, then we can save the planet. And yet, if we save the planet, we got to clean it up from people that are destroying it. Well, that's my point: is that the that the planet obviously is a whole lot more robust than we had imagined. 
I mean, if we're talking 5,000 years ago, an object moving at 20 miles per second slammed into the Indian Ocean and created tsunamis six to 800 feet high and gouged a hole 12 mile wide in the floor of the ocean. I mean, do you realize what kind of damage that's going to do to the global environment? Now, what I'm trying to get at is one event like that. Here, by comparison, try to imagine how much damage would be affected to the global environment by an all-out nuclear war. If we blasted everything we had, China blasted everything it had, India, Russia, all of us decided to shoot off every nuclear weapon we had, that still would pale in comparison to even a small cosmic event. We're talking right now maybe five to 6,000 megatons in the total global nuclear arsenal. One small event the size of a kilometer would be hundreds of times more forceful than that. Now, can you imagine, is there anything that we have done yet that has even remotely approached an all-out nuclear war in its consequences to the environment? No, there isn't. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Now, what I'm getting at is an all-out nuclear war pales almost into insignificance compared to one of these events. And, and again, this is not some science fiction pie-in-the-sky Star Trek episode. This is the reality that's going to force the human race to finally grow up. We have to come to terms with this, or there will be no future for our children and our grandchildren. It's that simple. And we're in hysterics over a background enhancement of 0.0008% of CO2. It's nuts. It's completely nuts. That's that's my take on it. Well, the only temperature of the Earth is only warmed up 1.2 mm -hmm. degrees, and that's that's a natural happens, a natural thing that happens all the time. And, and oh. now they also are talking about, they're complaining about pollution from human sulfur. They will the sulfur and the CO2 balance each other, and now I've never heard them once even talk about that. Right now, I don't want anybody to misread this and say, "Hey, hey, Reynolds up there saying it's okay if we pollute and throw our trash in the streams." And that is absolutely not what I'm saying. I absolutely believe we need to be good stewards of this planet, much better than we have been, and we have to learn from our mistakes. But we also have to realize that this industrial phase of civilization that we're in now is merely a temporary phase, and it's a phase we have to go through in order to get life off the planet. But it makes us want to you know, protect the planet issues. more because it's such a rare, <laughs> yes! it's a rare yes! likelihood yes! of yes! harboring high, higher intelligent life. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's proceed on before we run out of time. That was very good, Randall. This we're talking about here is what I've been <laughs> saying all along. Is there, but we can't lose our sense of humor about the whole thing, okay? If it turns out that you walk out of your, your house one afternoon or evening in the next few weeks or months and you look up in the sky and you see it heading towards us hey you know say wow this is going to be a great show but goodbye yeah sure yeah that's right and if you can do yoga you can do it easier if i have anything to do to say about it that ain't going to happen but you know hey i didn't think a year ago that necessarily ron paul was going to get as much attention that he's gotten I'd almost given up on the freedom movement in this country, and suddenly it's come alive again. Yeah. Yeah. This is very exciting. Well, make it yet. Yeah. Here we have a radiant. This represents meteors flying out of the radiant. It's like we're looking up a cosmic tunnel, and all of this stuff is barreling down the cosmic tunnel, the cosmic highway, and when we pass through it, we see this stuff flying at us. Here's a time lapse of the Leonids, and can you see if you follow these traces here, these are the stars, the fixed stars, but these at angles are the meteors coming in from this area of space. They're shooting in. The ones coming at us are shooting. They're, they're coming at us. Yeah, it's like, it's like looking up railroad tracks. That's Let's see this one. Yeah, here's, here is showing the constellation of Leo with the radiant superimposed. It's pretty clear that when you look at this, ancient peoples looking at a meteor shower like this would associate it with... There's very interesting legends. Howard Weiss, in his appendixes to his book on the Great Pyramid, recorded lots of ancient legends that I've never seen anywhere else. And he talks about like the dream of King Surud. Have you ever heard that? Who, in a lot of the legends, is given credit for building the Great Pyramid. The dream of King Surud was that he dreamt 
that a great dragon breathing fire was going to come out of the constellation of Leo and cause a great conflagration that would then be caused by a flood. And in order to preserve the science and knowledge and wisdom of his, of his day, he built a great pyramid as a, as, as a memorial, as a time capsule. Was he a historical at a certain time that he lived historically? That's vague. I mean, he's a legendary figure. Some say, well, maybe he was Khufu. Here's a Leonid fireball. Now, this is what happens when an object maybe the size of a basketball comes in to yes. the atmosphere. And it's got, see, it's got a little baby coming in with it. Mm -hmm. See, got a cute little thing on the side there. <laughs> so, hey, Brandon, you go back to uh, two uh, shows. That the one before that was, uh, yeah, look at it. Well, this is looking across. That's really something. So the ones, the bright star ones are the ones coming at us, the circles? No, none of them are coming at us. Oh. They're all, we're looking across, okay. across okay. Yeah. the thing here. I got you. Oops. They're going over towards Sam. Yeah. Toward what is, uh, what's the smallest object that will enter the atmosphere that won't burn up? That won't burn up? Oh, probably 20 to 30 feet. Okay. Somewhere. It depends, it depends a lot on what the object's made out of. Um, because you can have like almost like a lightweight, almost like a pumice rock. You can have a snowball, or you can have a heavy rock, or a piece of cast iron. Now, if it's on the denser end of the spectrum, it can be a lot smaller and, and hit the surface. It could be ice. But ice is fragile and is going to break up a lot more yep. readily. Now, there's a very interesting photograph taken by a high school student, I think. Where was that again? Australia, I believe. Now, you look at that, you can almost begin to see how the image of a fire-breathing dragon and how ancient people seeing events like this would use the dragon as a symbol. And then we talked about the great torrid meteor shower. And this is the one that I generally attribute to the Ice Age. We saw this graphic. We'll look at it real close. I mean, uh, briefly again, Sun, Mercury, Venus, here's the orbit of Earth going this way around the Sun, and here's a couple of the torrid meteors going around the Sun, and this date here would be spring equinox. If you see, there's the sign of Aries. So as the Earth is crossing, when the Sun has entered the sign of Aries, that's spring equinox. So this is going to be around March 21st, and then as it comes around here, Right around late June, it's going to be passing this area. So you can see any object coming from this way is going to be coming right from the direction of the sun. And this is what we were crossing on late June of 1908 when a piece of this torrid stream hit the Earth, or hit the Earth's atmosphere and blew up. Then coming around, here we would be crossing fall equinox, and then here we're getting to late October, early November. And this is where we catch the stuff from the backside, and this is where our Halloween comes in. Mm -hmm. And Halloween, you remember, was the universal ancient day of the dead. And this is the, the scientist that first figured out that Tunguska was part of the torrid stream. So I'm going to speed through all of this. Paul, I'm going to give you a... Do you have this? Well, you don't have the updated version, so I'll give you a new version of this. So, you know, how come some of them bounce off like that picture you showed? You know, the Tetons? Think about this. Okay, all you got to do is think about this. Go out and take a rock and drop it into, the, into a lake. It goes right in, right? Mm -hmm. But if you throw it at a low angle, you know, you, everybody skipped rocks off of the, the pond, right? It's the same principle. If it comes in at a shallow angle and hits the atmosphere, it can actually skip off. Now, how do you know from the, um, like the moon, where you can see where the, the asteroids have pummeled the moon, how do you know it's like 10 coming down versus one hop skipping? Oh. What's the difference? Because there's no way one would hop and skip. Because it's too forceful? Yes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to completely obliterate on impact. It won't do like on the water? No. Okay. No. Okay, I'm going to go on. I don't know how many of you guys would like to get a copy of this to study on your own. Yay. Well, just yeah, yeah. Let me know. Okay. I brought. I have actually one one copy tonight. And I actually, I think I owe you one, don't I, Leah? Yes, sir. Okay. 
I didn't forget. I know. I actually brought it for you and you weren't here the next week. Next week? The week oh, after oh, okay. you. Right. Okay, so uh, the Torrid, here's a picture, a nice picture of a Torrid fireball. Um, we're going to go speeding through this because I want to get to the new stuff. Okay, um, here we have cometary ca catastrophes, cosmic dust, and ecological disasters in historical times, the astronomical framework. Available data from fireball and comet observations, meteorite impacts, small lunar craters, and current near-Earth environment are assembled to yield a coherent picture of the interface between the Earth and its current interplanetary environment. The Taurid complex of meteors, meteoroids, asteroids, and comet Anki has probably been a significant and regularly visible celestial hazard from the last ice age through to the present day. These data lead to the expectation that history has been punctuated by one, Tunguska-like impacts, singly or as part of fireball swarms, two, freezing events of decadal duration due to cometary dust of dusting of the stratosphere, and three, occasional disastrous inundations of coastal areas due to small body ocean impacts. Now notice that there, he's taking this complex of stuff all the way back into the Ice Age. Now here we have a cave painting from 14,500 years ago during the Ice Age, right? Now, let's see here. Look at this. And what do you see? What's it a painting of? Cars. Oh, there's sure. There's now. The belt of uh, Orion in front of Where's the belt of Orion? Those dots in front of it. Above the bull. Yes. And what's this? That's the Pleiades. There's the Pleiades. Pleiades. Okay. Now, somebody hiked, perhaps taking refuge in a cave 14,500 years ago, painted an effigy of Taurus the bull on the wall. <laughs> this may have, a, have an, uh, a heretofore unappreciated significance. It's appreciated. And exactly this whole, this whole um, stereotype of the caveman, well, Not so much. If, you were, <laughs> if you were wanting to take refuge from things happening in the sky, from go? atmospheric oh. explosions, where would you go? Yeah. Okay. An obvious choice would be going into a cave. Absolutely. Okay, so show you this very briefly, and then we're going to, I want to get to at least introduce you to the Mayans take on all of this because it's going to start bringing to a close here, sorry. Already? I'm just getting warmed up. I know you are. <laughs> all right, here we have <laughs> hey, <laughs> radiant points of various cosmic entities. Here's the sun, and this is one of the key pieces of evidence by which scientists figured out, see where the radiant point of the Tarids is, and you see the letter Z? Yeah. That's where in space the Tunguska object came from. So you can see it's pretty darn close. So this is mm. the same doodah. Yeah. Oh, look, there's a circle cave. Okay, we're going to save this. What's oh, biogenesis? Oh, that sounds really cool. It is. Well, are we going to do that? If you're, if you're really nice. <laughs> if you don't piss me off. I have never pissed you off. <laughs> have I? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> there you go. One of the few. Okay. No oh well, God, we're, you know. See, I've still only shown you guys a fraction of what that I've got here. Ooh, okay, we got Man. I think we, we what we need to do is start meeting every night for a couple of months, and then I can, <laughs> my nerve <laughs> wouldn't take that. I know it's, you, you couldn't stand that much him. intensity, you could you? Encouraged him. Okay. Give him a fifteen-minute time frame. <clears throat> Just some examples here. Mexican Codex, a meteor as a cosmic serpent descending from the sky. And you see the knight there, or the, the warrior going about to do battle with the cosmic serpent. Now, the stars in there, what, what, what constellation are the stars in that thing? Um, the, where did it go? Josh, I can ask questions. That's a good question. I don't know. Stop. This I don't know. Uh, here's a European version of it. The, this is from Theatricum Cometicum. This is the traditional European depiction of the comet as a cosmic serpent. 
Here's another version of it. Meteor is a descending dragon. Turns out that there's lots and lots and lots of these representations of cosmic objects with dragons. And then, of course, our own famous serpent here in uh, Ohio. Mm -hmm. How many of you guys have been to Serpent Mound yet? I've been telling you, go to Serpent Mound. Mm -hmm. Here's the serpent effigy. And what you don't realize, most people don't realize when they visit this, you look at this, the serpent is actually sitting on the back of a big serpent. You see, here's the serpent winding, the human-created serpent. Well, look, here's the body of the geomorphic serpent, and here's his head right here. And, and now, it's on the edge of a four-mile wide. Well, yes, that's what I'm about to get to. Yeah. <laughs> over to the, this, over on this side, to this Ooh. side here, this is facing south. Over to this way, which is to the west, is a, well, as Bill was saying, there's a four-mile impact scar mm -hmm. that most of the uh, geologists have studied that think it was caused by a comet. Now, I find it more than just coincidental that the, one of the largest serpent effigies in the world, and the largest in North America, is built on the rim of a some type of an impact crater. But so you don't that think impact? that's unusual, because I would imagine it's done in other areas, too. What? You know, the impact is a perfect, or not a circle, but it's a nice circle to build these kind of things around it. Not necessarily. Can see, you see also notice it's built at the confluence of, there's a lot of interesting natural features that come together right at this place. But, in terms of the geomantic and geomagnetic energies yes. and so forth at a site about. like this, very interesting. And, yeah. and we're getting into a whole possibility of, a, of an esoteric science here. What's the date of the impact? The data, this is old, like three, over 300 million years old. Can you see that from Google Earth when you do a... Yes, you can. Okay. It's, it's not distinct like some of them, but you can see it. If somebody shows it to you, which either Brad or I could do, you, you would okay. see it. But if you go to Serpent Mound, you can find Serpent Mound on Google Earth. This Serpent Mound sits on the <clears throat> south, uh, east, southwestern rim, if I'm remembering. Southwestern rim. And then the... Turns out, like here, the red dragon. This is the flag of Wales, ancient Wales. They have, which, as it yeah. turns out, the, the the Dark Ages comet probably hit Wales. Okay. That's that's the, the contending yeah. theory right now. Cool. And it turns out that the very name that they use for for the red dragon also meant translated as lightning stone, but it meteor, also meant right? meteorite. Cool. Yeah. So there's there's lots and lots of this uh, evidence like this. The things that were used as symbols to represent meteorites. Hair, beams, beards. Um, I did a whole list of them. And these are all ancient accounts, legends. All this part here is about legends, comet types, comet types. Have we had more time? Is this next class? Yeah, we're going to pick this up. Okay. And this is the lead into the, the mines because, see, here, here's, here's the most comprehensive list of ancient symbols that were used to indicate comets, meteorites, or fireballs, right here. If you can remember this list, I guarantee you, you can go back and start rereading some of the ancient sacred writings, some of the uh, legends and so forth, and it'll open up a whole new level of meaning to it. Swords, spears, and arrows, beams, burning torches, burning lamps, Thunderbolts, the swastika was a very prominent ancient symbol that was used for a spinning comet nucleus. The broom, the sweeping away of the old. Stones from the sky. Chariot, as in the myth of Phaeton, where, where the, the, the fireball, the meteorite, was symbolized by Phaeton's chariot. Also a scythe and a sickle. And you notice how often death is always mm. depicted as carrying a sickle, right? That's interesting. Well, now that this opens up a new level of meaning for that. And uh, the myth of Phaeton. Phaeton with his hair on fire. So anytime now that you begin to see these symbols, look for a no new layer of meaning. The hair is associated with a comet. Um, so let me just show you very quickly what we'll pick up at. You know, if Paul would just keep me on track. Yeah, Paul. <laughs> Time frames. Okay. We will look at some of this stuff. Just hit him on the butt. Okay, take a look. Babylonian cuneiform. Uh, 
cylinder seals. Who can look at that and see where the symbol of comets is hiding up there? Right now. Where is the symbol of comets in this? It's hiding. It's hiding. I showed this to you. Where is it? Omega. There's two of them right here. The omega symbol. The omega symbol. Now, I am the Alpha and Omega. The mystery of the seven stars with the angel holes in his right hand. I guarantee if you, once you begin to grasp this information, you cannot go back and read the book of Revelations without seeing a whole new dimension of meaning. And so we're going to look at some of these ancient stuff like the cylinder seals, rock art, petroglyphs take on a new meaning. Um, and then we will get into this. Uh, okay, let's keep going here. Mithraism, which we've only briefly talked about a little bit in here. The symbolism of the, the Mithraic mysteries and the Eleusinian mysteries. Um, amazing stuff in there. You've seen that. We let me keep going, keep going, and get to the Mayan stuff, and you'll. Yeah. Now, it's been, in Christianity. It's hidden in a place that you're probably not even expected. But once you begin to recognize it, it makes perfect sense. When you start reading about the devil, Lucifer, the Antichrist, I always, years ago, before I ever knew about any of this stuff, I used to puzzle over the fact that Lucifer meant the bringing of the light, the bringer of the light. And I thought, well, if Lucifer is evil, why is he described as somebody bringing light? Right? Not evil. Rosalind Chapel. Well, it depends. It all depends. See? Mm -hmm. Because this whole thing can go either way, depending on our response to it. If we do nothing, yeah, it's probably going to be an evil consequence. But see, Lucifer, the fall of Lucifer is, is a key element of the whole Judeo-Christian tradition. Here he is shown bound and falling for, in Rosalind Chapel. But you see, once, and then what I do is we'll get into actually analyzing the original language used in these ancient writings. But there are many depictions of these demons and things that are falling, falling to earth from the sky. And then what we did from there was we went to the Mayan stuff, and give me one more minute, Sam, just to get down here to show you where we're going. Don't, don't get into that Mayan, Mayan stuff tonight. We'll start oh, I'm not. I'm not, 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 not going to get into it tonight. But just the, only a sneak preview. Yeah, just only the sneak preview. Sure, we want to see a little bit. That's, that's right, Verlaine. <laughs> My, uh, Mayan and Aztec stuff is full of this same kind of symbolism. I just briefly showed you this whole concept of the fall of Satan and these demons falling. Well, when we that's the old world. When we come to the new world, we find the exact same thing depicted in all kinds of different ways. A ceramic vase from 1200 A.D. showing a diving god holding in his hands something, which we'll get into next time. A Tulum, he's pretty much defaced, but... That was a diving god. That's Sayil. You can see up there in the center another diving god. A diving dog with flaming torches from the Dresden Codex. Zantamak, the fallen god from Codex Borgia. Uh, with the rattlesnake glyph, which is the oh. symbol for the Pleiades. There's lots and lots of this. A diving monkey figure. Wasn't that seven stars around them, too? Yeah. I'm going to yeah. just... The base of the falling Lord, the hanged man. See, we could go on and on here. I've got lots of this stuff talking about the Mayans, and the Mayans have preserved a very major chunk of this tradition for us in their in their ceremonies and so forth. So next in two weeks, or when are we when are we meeting again? So then yeah. are you going to wrap it back into this all in the seal spaceship on how this stuff all fits into how we need to create this and get it all? Because that oh, seems yeah. like another place. Well, you know. Yeah, I mean, the the deal is this, Elizabeth. I mean, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to solve a problem, the first thing you do is you try to learn as much as you can about that problem. Right, right. And that's what we're doing. And in fact, I would argue that in learning about the nature of the problem, the solution, of, in a sense, presents itself to us. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And I do believe that the ancient legacy from all kinds of sacred traditions actually conveys 
very critical information that will help us understand. And that's in fact is a big part of it. You saw the quick flashes up there of St. George battling the dragon? Mm. The Holy Grail. Once you've seen all this, the Holy Grail, the story of the Holy Grail is going to take on a whole new dimension of meaning. Ooh. Mm. And we've only touched upon that, but I have a whole presentation oh, just yeah. on the Holy Grail. Mm. Why don't we do you once a week? Well, thank you. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, Second. All right. Second day of January. That'll be the next meeting. Wednesday, for, with Randall. January. Okay.